Um, questions from the audience. I, are, I see one, two, three hands. We're going to collect three questions and then move from there. We'll begin here in the, in the front. Uh, Well, my name is Friedbert Pflüger. Uh, I'm German. I've been a colleague of Norbert Röttgen in the German Bundestag for 20 years. Uh, and uh, I would first of all say to Bogdan, he was very modest because not only Poland is back, but he is back. He was re-elected by 71%, <laughs> which is a wonderful victory, and we should, uh, hey. we should mention that. Bogdan. Uh, and, and uh, Bogdan, I want to address that, what you just said. You said NATO has been strengthened by this war. There is new unity. U.S. is back stronger uh, in Europe than ever. Uh, and Europe has lived up to that challenge. But if I hear the undertones in this discussion, uh, I think we have to put some question marks and I would like to be advocatus diaboli and point a picture and I'm hopefully that you can uh, bring forward the counter arguments. Well, the West is pretty weak. You are right, NATO, pretty good, but look to the United States and we see this enormous polarization and we don't know whether Mr. Trump will will win next time. Sir, Look if to you the could e formulate yeah, a yeah, question. Yeah. I'm, I'm coming you. very yeah. short to the question. EU, the same thing. Uh, look to, to Israel and the war in Israel and the EU position to that. So the question is whether we are not well advised to, to follow Mr. Zaki Laidi's uh, position, not to say it is just the West. If we want regulations in foreign affairs, we should not say it is only the West who is asking for that. Uh, if we do that, I think we found ourselves pretty much isolated in this world. Look at this BRICS uh, meeting that we had. People are fed up with this polarization. They want regulations. They do not want to, that war wins, as Norbert has put it. But if we put it as this is a Western value or a Western point, I think we are not doing the right thing. Thank you very much. Uh, this, this obviously is feeding into the whole discussion about the global South and, and the West in, in these terms, whether they're useful and what the perceptions are uh, around the world and whether we need to maybe come up with new terms. So let's, we're going to take two more questions. We'll allow yeah, you, to, okay. of course, to answer uh, to that in a moment. But first, uh, the gentleman in the one, two, three, four, Fourth row, please. And then we'll take one more question from that side. I think I, I see a hand. Thank you, Hiro Akita from Tokyo. So um, definitely uh, defeat of Ukraine is bad scenario, but uh, maybe worst scenario is simul simultaneous war in Europe and Asia. Obviously, uh, there are many, many focal points, like a Taiwan Strait or Korean Peninsula. So my question is, uh, how should we avoid the same scenario of World War I or World War II which, in which uh, war in Europe spilled over to Asia, especially World War II spilled over within two years after Germany invaded Poland in 1939. Then two years after that, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. So timeline was very, very fast. So my question is, how should we both win, both in Ukraine, but also deter China simultaneously? Thank you. Okay, so we've mm. got uh, the whole question about the West again, emphasizing that, but we've also got now the question of, of spillover. How do we avoid that? And there's a gentleman there in, in the hall. We'll take that question and then, oh. My, uh, Thank sorry. you very and much. And then we'll, we'll move over to the front here. Sorry, just a moment. Yeah. Volker Pertis from, from Berlin. If, if Norbert Rutkin is right, and I think he is, that Europe has to prepare itself from now to provide security for fellow Europeans threatened <coughs> by a power that doesn't respect the territorial integrity and sovereignty of its neighbors. If that is the case, what does it mean, and I would like you, Norbert, and probably your fellow Europeans to further elaborate, what does that mean for the institutional development of Europe? What does it mean for budgets? 
and what does it mean for the narrative which your party and others will have to pursue in the coming European elections? Thank you. Boy, that's a, that's a complex question. We could put together a whole panel on that. Uh, thank you, Volker Pertes. Uh, and we will take one additional question. Thierry Montréal, uh, Montréal had, uh, had drawn my attention to a lady in the front. Well, thank you, Elisabeth Guigou from France. I'm very happy that uh, at the beginning of the discussions, uh, Bogdan and Zaki and Norbert have given us some kind, some signs of optimism in this very uh, gloomy and worrying uh, context. So I want to come back to the European Union as they did at the beginning. After the war, and of course, it depends on how long this war will last and on which conditions it will end. But after the war, supposing that what we hope here is that Ukraine wins the war and can negotiate on acceptable terms uh, some kind of peace. What should be, in the view of the panelists, what should be the degree of autonomy, strategic autonomy of the European Union vis-a-vis -vis the United States? And given the fact that the European Union obviously will support the uh, massive co cost of the reconstruction of Ukraine. Thank you. So there's a lot on the table here. Um, much of it is, is institutional, focused on, on the European Union, uh, concerns about that and the whole question of, of strategic autonomy, uh, which has been around a big discussion for a long time. But what we get a feeling for here and also the, the broader global debate, because this does plug into the global debate about the West and what it is, and what it stands for and what's at stake here, but also the questions of this possibly spilling over. There has been a great deal of discussion about any lessons that uh, maybe other countries are taking from the Ukraine war about how to pursue its own foreign policy interests by violating another, uh, another area's territorial integrity. So let's get some responses from, from the panelists. Again, a lot on, from the panel, a lot on the table. Uh, who would like to begin? Uh, Norbert Lutkin. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And perhaps I would pick uh, the question of Volker Pertes. He asked if, if what does European security mean in terms of institutions, budgets, and narrative? And I, I would answer these questions in reverse order because when you start with a narrative, uh, the answers uh, uh, follow out of this, out of this, uh, of, of the response to the narrative. Yes, I think there is space and room and necessity for a European narrative. And only if you think about the possibility of an election of Donald Trump, which I consider as the nightmare uh, as such. We have the war in Europe, we have the war in the Middle East, but this this, this implosion of the West from inside, uh, there is, this is the real threat to the West, not from the outside, but from the inside. So if you just consider this for a moment as a possibility which can't be excluded, then the narrative is absolutely clear. We have to provide, as Europeans, for the security of our Europe. And security has become also in different, in, in other areas, uh, the new paradigm. There is, f people feel scared. Uh, they, they, they feel not uh, protected in different areas, in the economy, but also in, in uh, this uh, area of physical uh, uh, military uh, security. So I think this is the core narrative we have to develop and we can sell because it is the truth. It is what we are facing, that we have to provide uh, and care for ourselves and we can't rely uh, only and solely as we have done in the decade of the Cold War on America. And I say and I add, even if, if uh, uh, Joe Biden were to be re-elected, there will never be a time as we have seen in the Cold War when a Europe was only the receiver of European security. He will come back at some time 
to the new priorities of American policy, which is the reconstruction of the American uh, economy and, of course, the competition with China. So, either way, we will have to face this necessity. And if once we have made this clear, that this is the historic challenge of our time for Europe, then the, the, the ensuing questions get the answer. Of course, the budget has to follow uh, the essence, what is necessary for our time, and the institutions will adapt to, uh, to a policy which is necessary. So I'm, I'm no, not well, scared about that. May I ask you, though, just to intervene, yeah. uh, do you see the political will within the, among the European Union member states to come up with the ag agreement and the resources to create those, to strengthen those institutions, particularly on the military and defense side? Because right now, the European Union does not even yeah. have that identity outside of NATO. Yes, we are. So, what we can say that we have remarkably developed. So the, the state of mind and the state of policies after the war compared to the pre-war time is fundamentally different. For example, Germany, I really can say our society, our attitudes Absolutely. have as profoundly, as quickly changed as it has never occurred in the post-war period. However, I admit, not sufficiently. If you, if you measure it with the past, profoundly impressively, if you measure it against the, uh, what is necessary, insufficiently. So my answer to your question is, we could act out of insight and foresight. I do not expect this, unfortunately. What I fear is that we will act and more react out of necessity. We could avoid it, uh, we could be better prepared, but I think it's not hard to predict the circumstances that Europe has to um, bring itself to a, level, uh, where, to, to a level of responsibility because we are forced to act. And then Europe is acting quite, quite um, convincingly. I would just p point out at this point that the, the need that many see for reforming uh, institutional reform in the European Union, uh, also in terms of its decision-making process when it comes to foreign and security policy, if it's going to be only unanimous decision-making, that's going to be a difficult ask. Okay, we'll, we'll bring in Zaki Lady, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm always amazed uh, in such a debate to see to what extent the Europeans, the European Union, is constantly underrated, okay? And your comments, which are coming from a non-European view, but it's perfectly <laughs> acceptable, are the perfect illustration of this. I've lived longer you started, in Europe than You started else. talking <laughs> about the, uh, the limited effort, but I think that uh, uh, Mr. Rodgen made it very clear. I mean, the changes which took place in Germany are absolutely impressive. At the beginning of the war in Ukraine, people were laughing at the Germans because they had in mind to just send helmets to the Ukrainians. 5,000. Now, 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 Germany is the first provider of military aid to Ukraine behind the United States, okay? Huge change. And the quality, and the quality of the German equipment is outstanding. So I, as a European, <coughs> I'm very proud to defend what the Germans have done and the changes which took place. And even in regard to their uh, energy dependency, what Germany did is absolutely formidable. So I remember meetings uh, of the Gimnik just before the beginning of the war and journalists coming to the HRBP and telling him, but how, how can you have, expect having a common position of Russia whereas you are all divided? But he told him, wait a minute, wait the end of the, of the meeting and you, you'll see. And what happened after the meeting? That was the, the decision to take very harsh sanctions against, uh, against Russia. So, in terms of military effort, a change is taking place. But, of course, it's not going to happen uh, within a year or, or two years. It's a sea change. And let me just come to three questions. But, in fact, I don't see, 
a lot of disagreement among us. This sea uh, change, just to intervene. Yeah, but the, 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 very the word briefly. Titan vendor, I believe, is, is something that has been has been put out there now that on, in a result, on, result on, of this. On the EU-US relations, I think that we do agree that this uh, relationship is absolutely crucial, uh, fundamental. No, nobody's uh, this, the, I mean, putting into question the importance of this uh, relationship. But I think that we do all agree now that we need to make a, 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 a European effort on our side, and because we cannot foresee what could happen in, uh, in the future. Now, the point on which I, I disagree uh, respectfully with you it concerns the Global South. I mean, if you go to the Global South and tell them that in Ukraine we are defending Western values and you need to share the values, you are going to face a huge opposition so you should certainly not bring to them the Ukrainian issue through the lenses of a democracy because uh, you, you have to put uh, the emphasis on the, uh, the uh, territorial integrity of nation states. And in fact, you have democracies which are going to tell you, well, that's your problem, it's not yours. And if you take Latin America, why, I mean, is it part of the West or not? Is it part of the West or not? Okay? So, if you take Latin America, I mean, most of countries, almost all of them, are democratic countries, but their narrative um, and their interpretation of the conflict is not very different from Asian or African countries. They tell, okay, there was an aggression, but there are so many aggression in the rest of the world. And secondly, uh, it's an aggression, but don't expect from us more than condemning the, uh, the aggression because we have our own agenda and we don't want to see the Ukrainian agenda hijacked by other issues which are uh, much more important for us. And this narrative and this perception is widely uh, 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 present in the, in, in, in the world. And it doesn't matter if countries are democratic and non-democratic, African, Latin Americans, or Asian. It, it's simply not the truth. I mean, you have to look at the reality of the world as it is, and not as you expect it to be. Thank you. Um, Well, then, Cleet, uh, perhaps you can pick up on, on some of those points and also maybe speak to the, the question that was raised concerning the, the risk of spillover uh, in this, because that's a quite, quite great concern. Together with uh, Robert Gates, the United States faces more serious threats to its security today than it has faced in decades, perhaps ever. It has not before faced four allied adversaries at the same time, Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran, whose combined nuclear arsenal could be nearly twice the size of the US within a few years. This is uh, Bob Gates. Uh, of course, this is the specific situation of the US responsible not only for security in Euro-Atlantic area, but also engaged in other parts of, uh, of the globe. But let's not forget, you know, that, uh, uh, that to some extent this is also our problem, because the West consists, as we know, uh, of uh, two parts of the Atlantic uh, Ocean. That's why uh, uh, I am absolutely aware that there is a difference between those threats coming uh, uh, from the East and from the South. Mm -hmm. From the East, we have traditional conventional threat in the form of military aggression, full-scale aggression in the neighborhood of, uh, of Europe. When in the South, we have uh, we face more asymmetric, uh, more asymmetric threats because uh, nobody can predict that even the, the bad evolution of uh, uh, Hamas-Israeli war can be uh, can create a, a, create a military danger for for Europe. There can be massive uh, 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 migration flows. There can be. Uh, 
next wave of uh, terrorist attacks on our soil in the European Union. There can be various uh, cuts of uh, energy supplies to, to Europe, but uh, those uh, threats are different. That's why we should be prepared for with different uh, responses to those uh, threats. When we speak about, uh, about the US uh, possible policy or strategy after new elections, uh, presidential elections in the United States, yes, this is one of the main challenges for us, for the, for the West, and nobody can predict what will happen in the US. So we should be prepared to keep Americans in as we kept Americans in during the first uh, Donald Trump's presidency. Of course, political cohesion of, uh, of the alliance was undermined because of Donald Trump's uh, approach. But thanks to the commanders, uh, uh, great commanders of the US uh, armed forces, NATO cooperation, military cooperation was going uh, ahead. Mm -hmm. What we should do, what should we do in Europe? Uh, referring to what Elizabeth asked about. Uh, this is the Spanish presidency right now that concentrated uh, our thinking about uh, uh, strategic autonomy only on social economic issues. We abandoned uh, this military, po political military aspect during last, uh, last month yeah. because of this good cooperation with the United States because mainly of the Russian-Ukrainian war. We should keep thinking in those categories, social economic categories about, uh, about the European uh, strategic uh, autonomy. Okay. Not forgetting, only one sentence, not forgetting about the security and defense union that could be achieved according to the existing treaties. Because there is no mood for changes of treaties uh, uh, in the European Union, but we can go farther with uh, the European Defence and Security Union within the European Union. This is uh, one of the uh, possible directions. Thank you. Uh, we only have one minute and 30 seconds left, so I'd, I'd like to give uh, Epic Torch uh, Takajin a yeah, chance to you. intervene. Yeah. You know, I think uh, to live free, it's a universal desire, not the Western or Eastern sure. or Southern desire. This is universal desire. Why we choose freedom? I think because of that. We want to live free. And in my country, freedom is non-negotiable because freedom equals to our independence. Freedom equals to our, our right to exist. And be, I, I know in the West you may see some uh, socialists or even communists, even friends of autocrats. I think it's not new thing. But desire to live free is very important. That's a universal thing. But other thing I really concerned that this uh, Middle Eastern conflict, and also there are flash conflicts in, the, in Asia, South China Sea, Taiwan, and Korean Peninsula. And also North Koreans are delivering that arsenal, that weapons, they say almost 1,000 containers of weapons, and I, say, I read that. Those things little, yeah, concerning. And uh, maybe if there is more flash points, it may next in Asia. If that uh, come this war or conflict become more global, I think that's nightmare. Because of that, we have to talk about uh, more issues related with the global things. Not the, of course, we have to pay attention regionally. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lee. You ended directly on zero, zero. Uh, congratulations <laughs> for that. Uh, we are out of time. Uh, uh, it's obvious that we could continue the discussion for a long time. You said there's much need for discussion. Fortunately, we are at a place where we have uh, some uh, brilliant minds and some, some really experienced policymakers and, and analysts to help us uh, put things into context. I really appreciate your input from, from all of you. I, I was hoping for a frank uh, and open discussion. We oh, got no, that. Sure, sure, uh, sure. It's a really, really difficult subject. I hope we can follow it 
it up perhaps bilaterally at some point. I want to thank our audience for being with us today, and uh, feel, please feel free to, uh, you know, to continue our discussion maybe in, in the, later on. Thank you. Warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.